very much for attending PKC uh, this year. Uh, so this PKC is 25th PKC, uh, meaning that this is quarter century anniversary. <clears throat> so I'm Goicho Hanaoka, uh, program chair of this PKC. Uh, very unfortunately, uh, like the past two PKCs, uh, PKC 2000, uh, <clears throat> 2022 were able to uh, be held in uh, virtual. <clears throat> but uh, uh, we hope that we can make it an enjoyable international, international conference with you all. Oh, so the first of all, oh, uh, I would like uh, to introduce the brief summary of our uh, PKC 2022. <clears throat> Afterwards, uh, Professor Yohei Watanabe, uh, one of the general co-chairs, uh, will give uh, a general instructions for attending the conference. <clears throat> okay, uh, let me first introduce uh, the general chairs and uh, the program chair. <clears throat> uh, the general chairs are uh, uh, Junji Shikata from Yokohama National University, Japan, and uh, Yohei Watanabe, uh, University of Electro Communications, uh, Japan. <clears throat> and our uh, program chair is uh, me, uh, Goicho Hanaoka uh, from National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, uh, ICE Japan. <clears throat> and uh, the next, uh, I would like to uh, explain the, the overview of the paper selection. <clears throat> So the, the submission deadline was September 16th uh, last year. And <clears throat> so the, the, we, we used uh, hot CLP uh, instead of the web sub review. Uh, and uh, this is the first time uh, to use hot CLP in PKC. Uh, therefore, we have some small troubles. Uh, but fortunately, uh, there was no big trouble. <clears throat> and uh, our notification uh, was the, uh, on uh, November uh, 30th <clears throat> uh, last year. And uh, so in the review process, uh, we, the, how's it, the rebuttal or phase was not introduced, but the frequent uh, communications were made with the OSIS. <clears throat> and uh, we uh, received uh, 137 uh, submissions. And uh, that we selected papers for acceptance uh, with the aim of achieving an acceptance rate of about 30%. Uh, at the end of the uh, review process, <clears throat> Uh, we accepted uh, 40 papers, uh, but the, uh, so among these uh, 40 papers, one papers were later uh, withdrawn uh, by the authors. <clears throat> so therefore, finally, uh, we, uh, the, the, the number of accepted papers uh, became uh, 39, which is where to be, you know, the lower than the 30% of the acceptance rate. <clears throat> okay, now from my viewpoint, uh, there seems uh, uh, some trends in accepted papers. <clears throat> uh, 18 papers uh, uh, seem to have a close relationship with post-quantum security. And this is actually uh, also encouraged in the corporate papers, so therefore it is not very surprising. And uh, also the 21 papers uh, seem to have a, a close relationship with uh, privacy preserving computation. Uh, with the recent in increased attention to uh, pet privacy enhanced enhancing technologies, uh, it is likely that uh, there is also increased attention uh, to the building blocks to the pets. <clears throat> uh, moreover, uh, the seven papers seem to have a uh, close relationship with blockchains. And uh, this uh, overlaps with the uh, uh, 21 papers related to pets technologies about 
<coughs> and may be uh, considered a subset of that. <coughs> So here, uh, let me briefly introduce the program committee. <clears throat> so I apologize uh, for not being able to all read uh, everyone's name due to the time constraint, uh, but I would like to thank all of them for all their efforts uh, regarding paper selection. So thank you very much. <clears throat> So in PKC, we have two invited talks. The, the first one uh, will be given by Dr. Dustin Modi, <clears throat> and title is Beginning Over the End, uh, the first NIST PQC standards. <clears throat> so Dr. Modi <clears throat> sorry, is uh, one of the key persons uh, in the NIST PQC standardizations, and uh, will be speaking about the uh, latest status of the project. And the second one will be given by Professor Yulian Zhen, uh, who is a, uh, the chair of PKC Steering Committee. And title or uh, is first 25 years of the PKC Annual Conference. <clears throat> so since uh, this is the uh, this PKC is uh, a quarter century anniversary, uh, Professor Zhen will, will give a special talk on the history of PKC to date as the chair of the PKC Senate Committee. <clears throat> and uh, so in addition, the test of time award will also be presented at this uh, year's PKC. So based on the number of citations and uh, other factors, uh, the PKC test of time award is selected from the papers presented at PKC more than 15 years ago. Uh, in accordance with uh, uh, our regulations. Uh, this year, we so two, two, two papers have been selected uh, for the award, and uh, this will be announced tomorrow. <clears throat> so finally, I would like to introduce the, the members of PK Sister and Committee. Uh, um, since the beginning of this year, uh, Abe and uh, Chong and uh, Lange uh, have joined us as uh, new members. Uh, this structure will be responsible for deciding the future management policy of PKC. Okay, thank you. So next, uh, your hair will give the brief instruction of the conference. Yes, let me share my screen. Hold on, uh, this one. <clears throat> Hang on. Oh, the screen is black. Oh. Yeah. Why? Why does it happen? Yeah. So. Oh, no. Sorry. I okay, crashed. you have, uh, <clears throat> I will, I will show the slide. Okay. Oh, uh, no, maybe okay. I can do that. Uh, right? Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, great. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, shall I start? Okay, I'm Yohei. So, uh, and I are serving as general chairs of uh, this year's PKC. And we had originally uh, planned to uh, organize PKC 2022 as a hybrid event. Uh, we chose Pacific Pacifico Yokohama, yeah, this building, as a venue and uh, devoted our energies to preparing the conference. Uh, Pacifico uh, is a uh, world-class convention complex. Uh, 
in Yokohama's uh, futuristic, Yokohama's futuristic uh, Minato Mirai 21 waterfront uh, district. Yeah, yeah, some documents. Yeah, I I know the words from the some documents, and it's it's worth noting that uh, Pacifico also uh, hosted the first PKC uh, back in uh, 1998. If you participated in that uh, first PKC, uh, you might recall the uh, experience foundry and be surprised by uh, Yokohama, uh, the development of Yokohama's urban areas. Anyway, uh, at the end of November 2021, uh, due to the emergence of the Omicron variant, uh, the Japanese government unfortunately decided to hold new entries from abroad. And uh, uh, we had also planned a special excursion to Kamakura uh, to commemorate the uh, PKC's 25th anniversary. Uh, and Kamakura was the capital of Japan 80, uh, 800 years ago. And you could have enjoyed uh, visiting temples and uh, other cultural uh, experiences. However, yeah, due to COVID, uh, we were uh, how say we were forced to give up our plans for hybrid event. And in the end, uh, we decided to switch to a virtual PKC uh, to be held over four days. Although uh, it was a difficult decision, uh, we chose a schedule that starts at 8 a.m. Japan time. Uh, since uh, we are different size on uh, international deadlines, uh, so most attendees are now on Monday, Right, and as a result, the conference dates are moved up for them. Uh, we apologize to attendees in Asia and Europe uh, who still have to separate for events. And uh, all talks and discussions will be held on Zoom and Zurip, uh, as the style is uh, becoming the standard uh, for bunch of ISL conferences. Uh, all sessions will be live streamed on uh, ISCR YouTube channel too. Oh, sorry, there's typo. So, so far we have received over 270 illustrations uh, and we give, uh, we'll give the detailed statistics in the closing remarks, okay. Uh, okay, and most people who are watching this uh, have already logged into the portal, but some are uh, what probably watching on YouTube so this information would be helpful to them. Uh, you can log into the portal via uh, the join the conference button or join the conference portal button uh, on the website. And then you can access uh, Zoom sessions, Zoom chat, uh, some puzzle and social rooms. In each session, uh, every five minute talk uh, will be followed by five minutes of Q&A uh, and all papers are available, available on the website. Uh, and on the uh, program page, you can find links to fully pre-recorded presentations for almost all the talks. And uh, there are two ways to ask questions during sessions. Uh, first, uh, as in regular uh, in-person conferences, uh, you can use the lazy hand function to ask your questions orally. And you can uh, also write your questions in the chat. Uh, Zoom is okay, but uh, we recommend using Zurip chat uh, because uh, it allows longer interactive discussions. Uh, we have virtual social hours after each day's uh, last session. You can join from the portal and there are several social rooms. Uh, you can find who is in each room uh, before joining. Uh, bring a drink and enjoy the party. Uh, it's still before noon in Japan, so. And uh, uh, there's a lot of people uh, who join, uh, who Junji and I want to thank. First, uh, our thanks to the program chair, Boichiro Hanaoka, for working on, uh, not only on not only the program tasks, but also with organizing lots of other things. Uh, the local organizing committee members were committed to organizing our hybrid PKC. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, it was not to be. Uh, we thank them for their for efforts. 
Uh, we would like to thank the ISCL Board of Directors and Coronavirus Emergency Committee, uh, particularly Michelle Abdallah and Brian Amakia uh, for their advice and support uh, on our budget plans uh, and making the switch to a budget conference. And to maintain the program page and organize, organizing, uh, organize our uh, budget PKC, we did receive a lot of help from Kevin McCurry and Ken McCurry uh, as in previous budget conferences. Uh, we'd like to thank them for all their hard work. And of course, we'd like to thank all the attendees. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, we'd like to thank the foreign organizations for their uh, generous uh, sponsorship and other contributions. Uh, the Inoue Foundation for Science, uh, Kayamori Foundation of Information Science Advancement, uh, Hitachi, Japan Datacom, KDDI Research, Mitsubishi Electric, NEC, TII, and finally Toshiba. Yeah, uh, that's all. Uh, enjoy the conference and please follow us on Twitter. Uh, Kevin and Kay, do you want to add something? I don't have anything to add. I think you pretty much covered it. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, then uh, I think I'll I... just put an email address in the chat in case anybody needs to contact us for problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think I should hand over to Koichiro uh, Hanoka-san or okay. Kuro-san-sensei. Uh, okay, yeah. then let's start our first session. The, please handle all the first session, uh, Kuro-san-sensei. Hi, okay. Um, good morning from Japan. Welcome to the first session of PKC 2022. This session is on MPC and secret sharing. We have five talks. Each will be five minutes long, followed by five minutes Q&A. The first paper is the usable two-round MVC from LVN by James Fatsik, Abhisharayam Srinivasan, Sanjam Garg, and Inu Zhang. Inu will give a talk. Hi, uh, you know. Are you ready? Oh. No speaker. It might be best to go to the second talk until we can figure out what's wrong. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't receive any emails or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. It now, we go on to the second session. And uh, we go on to the second paper. Uh, on the bottleneck complexity of MCC with correlated randomness by Claudio Orlandi, Diva. Ravi and Fita Shaw. Divya, Divya will give a talk. Um, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, okay. thank you uh, for the introduction. I will, yeah. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so this talk is on the bottleneck complexity of MPC with coerted randomness based on a joint work with Claudio Orlandi and Peter Scholl. So secure multi-party computation or MPC allows a set of N mutually distrusting parties to compute a combined function on their private inputs. And the guarantee is that at the end of the MPC protocol, uh, the parties get the correct function output and that nothing beyond the function output will be revealed. 
Now there are different ways to measure the efficiency of an MPC protocol. And one such popular measure is that of communication complexity, which measures the total number of bits that honest parties send during the protocol execution. Bottleneck complexity is a flavor of communication complexity. And to understand that, let's look at this protocol A, where every party is sending a single bit to a central party. And next, there's another protocol B, where again, every party is sending a single bit, but this time the bits are being sent over a chain-like fashion. Now, if you see that the total number of bits being sent in both the cases are the same, so the communication complexity is actually the same, but the second protocol seems much better in the way the communication is distributed because it's more balanced among the parties. So to capture this, the work of Boyle and others, they introduced this notion of bottleneck complexity, which is defined as the maximum communication complexity of any party within the protocol. So if you consider protocol A, that will have bottleneck complexity at least of order n, because the central party here is receiving n minus one bits. But in the protocol B, the bottleneck complexity would just be a constant independent of the number of parties, because here, each party is sending and receiving at most one bit. So now if you have a situation in which the, the receiving bandwidth of this central party becomes a bottleneck, then you would prefer protocol B in practice. So our focus was on settings where uh, the number of parties is very large. And that's why the goal is to design protocols having bottleneck complexity independent of the number of parties. And we refer to such protocols as being BC efficient. And such protocols were studied by this work of Boyle and others. But on the negative side, they showed that it's actually impossible to get BC efficient protocols for general functions. More specifically, they showed that even if you don't care about security, still you cannot get protocols having a bottleneck complexity sublinear in the number of parties for general functions. However, uh, on the positive side, they presented a compiler that transforms any insecure protocol to a secure one while preserving the bottleneck complexity. And this compiler was uh, based on FHE. Since FHE is relatively inefficient, it's very natural to ask that if you restrict yourself only to specific functions, then can you get protocols with low bottleneck complexity without relying on FHE? And this is what we try to address in our work. And we consider this specific setting where the adversary is semi-honest and he can learn the internal state of up to n minus one corrupt parties. And we also assume that uh, the parties have access to a correlated randomness setup. So for this setting, we design BC efficient protocols for two function classes. The first function class is abelian programs, which can be expressed as a function on the sum of parties inputs over an abelian group. And this is actually a, an expressive class of functions which covers applications like voting and linear classifiers. And the second class is that of selection functions where the input of the first party is a selection index that can vary from two to n and the output is nothing but uh, the input that the first party has chosen to learn. So for both these classes, we designed BC efficient protocols having bottleneck complexity independent of N. And uh, for this, we relied on the tool of Kabel circuits, which can be built from one way function. And for the second construction, we also use additively homomorphic encryption that can be instantiated from standard number theoretic assumptions. Now, a um, common design feature of our protocols is that uh, we use this chain-like interaction pattern. So like we saw in the example earlier, this seems promising to get bottleneck complexity independent of the number of parties, because here you're only talking to your neighbors over the chain and you have only constant number of neighbors. But that's not enough to just design protocols on the chain. You also need to ensure that the number of traversals you are making over the chain, that should be independent of N. And the size of the messages that you're sending, even that should be independent of N. So these are some properties that our constructions uh, satisfy. And I would like to refer to the longer version of the talk or the paper for further details about this. So with this, I conclude my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Divya. And are there any questions from the audience? Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. 
Um, you redu you minimizing the polyphenolic complexity. Are you also basically re uh, uh, getting a uh, making uh, a, a large a de a message depth where you uh, party a part party three can't send a message to party four until he hears from party two, and. Uh -huh. Yeah, so in the way that we are doing it, like the number of uh, rounds or like you're saying, the depth is increasing because the way that we're doing it, with that, there is some dependency that you need to uh, wait for the previous party. But uh, yeah, so it, internally, this is happening that uh, maybe the number of rounds is increasing. Uh, but that would be interesting to understand the trade off between these two measures. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So the previous scheme based on FAT uh, also considers only semi-honest adversaries? Uh, so they have two uh, kinds of protocols. One of them was for the semi-malicious, like it's a, a little bit stronger than semi-honest in which uh, maybe you can pick the randomness in a bad way, but still you follow the protocol steps. And then they also had like, uh, they also made it, uh, they compiled into, into a malicious version also. So they had a, even a malicious uh, compiler. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Uh, okay, uh, free, feel free to type your question on the in the chat, and then <coughs> uh, we can discuss later. <coughs> so, okay, thank you, uh, Laville. Thank you. Okay. The next three slides, loop communication, one party triple generation for feeds from ring LCN by Damiano Aurang and Fita Shaw. And Damiano will give a talk. Hi, let me share the slides. Can you see them? Yes, we can. Yes. Perfect. So hi, everybody. My name is Damiano, and now I'm going to present our project. So the main contribution is the design of the first M-party offline phase for speeds with sublinear communication in the amount of generated material and concrete efficiency. In particular, we generate N authenticated Viva triples with O or square root of N communication. And we obtained this result by designing the first practical M-party PCG for authenticated Viva triples. And the seed size of this PCG is O or square root of N. So authenticated Beaver triples are a particular type of correlated randomness that is needed in MPC protocols like speeds. Usually we need a lot of them and their generation is rather expensive. So our setting is a large prime field F and we have N parties holding a secret sharing of a random Mac key alpha. An authenticated Beaver triple with respect to alpha is a random tuple of secret shared elements as the one that you see on the screen. So we have X and Y that are uniform over F we have a secret sharing of their product, and then we have three max, x times alpha, y times alpha, and x times y times alpha. So we want to generate a lot of authenticated Beaver triples using a tool called pseudo-random correlation generator or PCG. This is an unparty construction that specifies how to generate n small seeds, one for each party. And when these seeds are distributed, everybody can locally expand them, obtaining a large amount of authenticated Beaver triples without any communication. So the good things of these PCGs is that usually it is not difficult to substitute the trusted dealer with an MPC protocol with low communication. And that's because the size of the seeds is low. So uh, when we compose these protocols with the non-interactive expansion phase, we immediately have protocols that provide the parties with a large amount of authenticated Beaver triples with low communication. Uh, the security of our uh, construction relies on the ring LPN assumption. Uh, our setting is a ring R, which is the quotient between the polynomial ring over F and the idea generated by a polynomial F of X. We also have two parameters. The first one is C, which is a small constant. And then we have T that is roughly the size uh, of the security parameter lambda. 
we also have a distribution HWT that outputs a random T sparse polynomial in R. So now consider pairs as the one that you see on the screen. So we have A that is uniformly distributed over R to the C. And then we have the inner product between A and another vector E, where E is sampled according to HWT to the C. So in particular, E is a C-dimensional vector, and each entry is a T-sparse polynomial. Now, the ring LPN assumption states that even if A is known, the inner product looks random over R. So in order to design a PCG for authenticated beaver triples, we had to find a way to compress N of them into small seeds. So the first thing that we do is uh, to instantiate the ring LPN assumption over a ring R that is isomorphic to F to the N. And F to the N is a ring with pointwise addition and multiplication. So thanks to this isomorphism, it is possible to convert the N authenticated beaver triples into a single one, but over the ring R. And what I mean is that now X and Y are uniformly random over R. So our goal now is to compress this single ring uh, beaver triple and we are going to do this term after term. And we start from X and Y. So as I said, these are uniform over R. So suppose that there is a random oracle that provides the parties with a random element A in R to the C. Each party PI samples two vectors of sparse polynomials, UI and VI, and then it sets each share of X to be XI, the inner product between A and UI, and the share of Y to be YI, the inner product between A and VI. So by the ring LPN assumption, XI and YI look random, but now their entropy is low because everything is defined in terms of sparse polynomials. Next, we compress the remaining terms. Um, it turns out that compressing the first three that you see on the slide is equivalent to compressing two party secret sharings of the material you see uh, on the screen, whereas compressing the last one is equivalent to compressing three party secret sharings of uh, what you see on the right. So since everything here is uh, described in terms of sparse polynomials, it is possible to compress uh, this material using a tool called uh, DPF or distributed point functions. For the three elements on the uh, left, we just need two party DPFs. So the size of the compressed material is logarithmic in N, whereas for the thing on the right, we need three party DPFs that are not as efficient. And so the size of the compressed material is O of square root of N. Here also we had some troubles because we had to uh, adapt the known construction for three party um, to large prime fields. And this turned out to be very difficult. So in the end, we had to uh, um, allow some leakage, but luckily our PCG is secure anyway. So finally, we designed an actively secure protocol that generates and distributes uh, the seeds of the PCG with low communication. And the total communication complexity scales as the square root of n, but also as the fourth uh, power of the number of parties. The computational complexity scales as n times log n. And for n equal to 2 to the 20, the protocol is practical based on estimations. And uh, the communication complexity is roughly 10 times better than overdrive, the best solution known so far. So uh, that's all. And thank you for the attention. Uh, thank you, Damian. And are there any questions from the audience? <clears throat> Please speak up if we have any. So the, the hardness of ring LPN is related to some um, worst case um, hardness of that some kind of large problem. Yeah, uh, it was a, an assumption that was introduced in another paper by, uh, yeah, Boyle et al, uh, Crypto 2020. So yeah, uh, I didn't work on the analysis, mm. uh, so I wouldn't, I'm not able to answer the question. Okay. Other questions?
Okay, thank you, Darian. Yeah. The next FIFA is storing and retrieving secrets on the blockchain. By Rufa Goyal, Abhiram Kosafari, Elizabeth Maserova, Brian Falno, and Ivan Song. Elisa will give a talk. Um, hi, I'll try to share my screen. Um, can you guys hear me? Can, can you yes. see the slides? Yes. Yes, to okay. both. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Lisa. Um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, let's dive right in. So, um, one of the contributions in our work is designing a new uh, secret sharing scheme. Um, recall that a secret sharing scheme with threshold T enables a party to um, distribute shares of a secret to some N parties. It must be possible to reconstruct the secret using T plus one shares. And at the same time, an adversary in um, control of less than T plus one parties who hold these shares must learn no information about the secret. While uh, secret sharing is great, um, there are cases where traditional schemes seem insufficient. For example, when uh, secrets must be stored for a long time, um, it seems reasonable that the committee, the set of parties who hold the secrets um, can change. To achieve security in um, the setting, dynamic proactive secret sharing schemes are used. EPSS schemes typically consider, uh, consist of three algorithms uh, set up. Um, this is um, the algorithm where clients store the secrets. Uh, handoff, um, where the uh, um, clients, uh, where the um, secrets are passed from one set of parties, hold the committee to the other set of parties, so to the new committee, and reconstruction, where committee members interact with the user to let this user uh, obtain the secret. In our work, we introduced FAB DPSS, uh, which stands for Fast Batch DPSS, and it is a highly optimized batch DPSS scheme. It has both um, very good communication complexity and practical efficiency parameters. In addition to FabDPSS, we proposed eWeb. Um, eWeb is a blockchain-based DPSS application, which can be seen as an alternative to extractable witness encryption. Um, witness encryption allows one to encrypt a message with respect to a particular um, NP search problem instance. If a user knows a witness, then she can decrypt the ciphertext. Witness encryption is um, called extractable, um, if it additionally provides extractability, which is a strong uh, security property. Note that there are numerous applications which require this property, but unfortunately, um, there are known practical extractable witness encryption constructions and no constructions based on standard assumptions. In this talk, we will first look into the main ideas behind our effective basis construction. And then I will introduce EWEP and um, we will briefly discuss um, the applications of EWEP. In um, FAB DPSS, we consider a computationally bounded, fully malicious um, adversary who can um, adaptively choose parties to corrupt at any time. Um, the adversary is allowed to corrupt less than half of each committee. Note that the handoff phase is particularly challenging as during this phase, not only T, but two T parties can be corrupted. Um, T parties from the old committee and T parties uh, from the new committee. So um, let's first start with the semi-honest case where parties follow the protocol, but might, might try to gain some extra information about the secret. Note that um, FIPDPSS is based on Shamia secret sharing, uh, which in essence is a degree T polynomial where the secret is encoded at point zero and uh, the i's share is encoded at point i. 
the foundational idea in our fabric pieces construction is um, what we call coupled sharings. By this, we mean two sharings which have the same value, even though the particular shares which lead to this value uh, might be different for the two sharings. Now to refresh um, a um, sharing of some secret S, the new committee can prepare a coupled sharing of a uniform random value R. The old committee will receive shares of one part of the coupled sharing, and the new committee will receive the shares of the other part. Now what you can do is the old committee can now reconstruct and publish S plus R. And the new committee can set the new sharing to be S plus R minus the sharing of the other part of the coupled sharing. Since uh, both parts of the coupled sharing are, um, lead to the same value R, the um, resulting sharing is still the um, sharing of the secret S. In addition to introducing the coupled sharings, we found ways to um, prepare these sharings efficiently and also to deal with the um, fully malicious case. So um, in this case, for example, the party could distribute an inconsistent degree T sharing or could distribute um, an invalid couple chain where like the parts of the couple chain do not correspond to the same value. Um, solving these questions allowed us to achieve a DPSS scheme, which um, among the schemes which provide the um, highest possible adversarial threshold of one half has um, the best um, communication complexity parameters. Um, specifically uh, um, in our case, um, our amortized complexity is open, while the state of the art job has uh, open squared. Um, both schemes achieve the same amortized complexity. In addition, our evaluation shows that uh, FabDPSS is also completely efficient. Um, all operations, this is the handoff phase, all operations um, complete in seconds and it outperforms the state of the art job by over six times. And as I mentioned before, uh, in addition to FabDPSS, we propose even um, an alternative to extractable with this encryption. Specifically, we ask the following question. Um, can users store secrets and specify release conditions for them, such that possibly other users can retrieve these secrets if and only if they are able to satisfy the release condition? And obviously our goal is to do so without relying on trusted third parties. An EVAP system consists of three subroutines, secret store, secret handoff, and secret release. These are very similar to the algorithms used by DPSS, with the difference that a release condition is specified by the user who is uh, depositing the secret. And um, the user who is requesting the secret is able to retrieve it if and only if um, the um, release condition is satisfied. Note that while we can use a DPSS scheme um, as a base for our EVAP construction, we need to solve a few additional challenges to obtain a secure um, EVAP scheme. For example, it is not immediately clear how users can prove that um, the release condition for a secret is satisfied without revealing the proof to the malicious miners, who could then use it to also obtain the secret. Um, please refer to our papers to see how we um, solve these issues. And last but not least, we use EVAP to enable a bunch of very exciting applications, which typically rely on extractable witness encryption. Uh, for example, we explain um, how EVAP can be used to achieve time lock encryption, which allows one to encrypt a message, such as it can be um, decrypted if and only if um, um, a certain deadline has passed. EVAP can also be used to implement the so-called deadman switch, um, which under certain conditions triggers um, a process such as making or deleting some secret data. Other applications um, include fair exchange and fair ABC, um, runtime programs, and many more. Um, that is all I have. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Oh, yeah. thank you, Elisa. Are there any questions from the audience?
so you use blockchain. So uh, I guess uh, smart contract functionality of blockchain is used, right? So for this one, we do not really use like the smart contract functionality. Mm -hmm. So for our e -web construction, we use basically DPSS and um, to prove the uh, um, um, that a release condition is satisfied and use uh, a certain kind of a music with like a couple of additional details to make sure that the music can, cannot be reused. Other questions from the audience? Okay, thank you, Elisa. Thank you. The next talk I favor is CNF, FSS, and its applications by Fall Moon, Eva Kshilvitz and Rafael Ostrovsky for we go a talk. Hi. Uh, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, is, can you hear me and see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Paul. I'm here to talk about joint work with Eyal Kushalevitz and Rafael Ostrovsky. Uh, about CNF FSS and its applications. Um, so I'll, I'll give a short background on, on those two things, FSS and CNF key sharing, um, and then talk about our two applications briefly and conclude with a summary. Uh, so function secret sharing, we, we saw a little bit at, in, about it in a previous talk. Um, so it was created in 2014 by Gilboa and Ashai. Um, and it was meant to extend the notion of, of sharing a secret value. Um, so we're familiar with secret sharing from, from the various talks today. So in function secret sharing, the idea is instead of having a single value, we now are sharing a function across multiple parties um, such that each party doesn't understand what the function is by itself, but if approved groups get together and combine their secrets, uh, they can reconstruct the function. Um, so FSS is only known for certain classes of functions. The first one that was studied uh, were for point functions. Um, so a point function, you have some domain and is zero everywhere except at a single point in that domain. Um, and in the context of, of MPC and various uh, secret crypt cryptographic applications, um, generally the secret location, the location of the point function is secret. Uh, as well as the, the value that the point function attains at that point. Um, so in the original works, uh, these problems were completely solved, where solved here means the communication complexity, how big the key is um, that is delivered to, to the parties that represent the function. Uh, so if the size of the point function is n, um, even for an insecure solution, uh, just to describe the location, uh, of the non-zero value, you would need log n bits. Um, so log n is a lower bound of how much information you would need to encode in these keys. Uh, and they indeed constructed distributed point functions that achieve this lower bound of log n bits. Um, this is just for the two-party case where you have two parties that are reconstructing the function. Um, in general, if uh, the number of parties is more than two, um, and the threshold for how many parties are needed to reconstruct the secret is, is more than just one, um, then less is known. So log n is still the theoretic lower bound. Um, the original papers, uh, as we saw in an earlier talk, um, provide an upper bound of, of root n uh, bits of communication for the key. Uh, so there are many applications of function secret sharing um, that were discussed in the original papers as well as in subsequent work. So PIR, PIW, ORAM, PCGs, and worst case average case reductions. Um, so that was one half of our title, the FSS uh, half. The other part is CNF key sharing. Um, so this was introduced by Ido et al. in, in 87, um, has various names, replication-based sharing and multiple assignment secret sharing. Um, so in the idea of CNF key sharing is instead of each party getting a single key, uh, they get multiple keys and 
uh, depending on the group that is attempting to reconstruct the secret, they use different keys to reconstruct. Oftentimes uh, in these schemes, you have um, a set of parties that, that have uh, keys that uh, uh, if, if you were to enumerate all the parties of, of size T where T is your threshold, um, then you can assign keys to each such subset where each party gets a key that uh, uh, corresponds to the enumeration of, of a, all the sets that he is not a member of. Um, CNF key sharing has been used in lots of applications, uh, verifiable secret sharing and MPC protocols, uh, fault tolerance and redundancy, uh, PIR and, and other generalizations, if you just view it as a special case of formula-based secret sharing. Uh, so there's two parameters of interest, the threshold T and the number of parties P. Uh, in this talk, we consider two specific cases um, listed there, uh, although in the paper it talks about more general cases. Um, okay, so our first result, uh, well, I guess I should say both our results uh, are intended to show how CNF FSS can be used to make um, regular standard FSS uh, more efficient in terms of the communication um, of the size of the key. Um, so in our first result, uh, as I mentioned before, the one out of P case of FSS is completely solved. Um, but with the number of parties bigger than two and the threshold bigger than one, uh, the best known general solution requires uh, quadrat or square root n communication. Um, in a follow-up work uh, by Boyle et al., uh, they showed for certain cases of, of P, uh, they can uh, achieve uh, uh, fourth root of n communication. Uh, but this requires P to have special forms. And in general, communication becomes easier with as the number of parties grow. So here, if you have nine parties and you want a scheme where any two parties can reconstruct, uh, they show how to do that in fourth root N communication. Um, so our first results um, uh, attain uh, standard FSS by using CNF FSS as a building block. Um, and we show that for these choice of parameters where P is the number of parties, T is the threshold and D is uh, whatever parameter uh, you choose to make the inequality hold, um, then you can achieve communication um, N to the one over two D. Um, so as an example, if, if the number of parties is five and the threshold is two, uh, then you can set D equals two here uh, and you get N to the one fourth communication. Uh, and as noted, the previous best for, for five parties with threshold two was, was root n. Um, and then we also show how this can be extended for information theoretic security. Uh, you lose a factor of two in the exponent here. Uh, so the communication then is n to the one over d. Uh, our second result constructs a one out of three CNF FSS scheme, which has various applications. Um, so again, uh, stepping back and looking at standard FSS, uh, as mentioned, the one out of two case is totally solved. It achieves the log n size of the keys. The two out of three case um, is not solved. Again, the best known result for two out of three is square root n. Our, our early re earlier result I just showed was for two out of five, but for two out of three, the best known is still square root n. Um, so there remains a, a large gap between these two. Um, and observe that one out of three CNF FSS lies somewhere in between one out of three and two out of three. Um, so on the one hand, if you look at the key sharing, the CNF part of one out of three, there are three keys that are generated total and each of the three parties gets two of them. Um, and for two out of three FSS, it's a similar case. Here you have three keys total each party gets one of those keys, but because of the two out of three security, uh, if any party sees not only their own key, but one of the keys of the other two parties, um, still they cannot reconstruct the secret. Um, so in both of these cases, you have a, a party that is able to see two of the three total keys um, and cannot reconstruct the, the secret function. Uh, and just as a simple observation, two out of three FSS implies one out of three CNF FSS. So it is a stronger uh, notion. Um, that said, 
Uh, for some applications, you may not need full two out of three security. Uh, perhaps the CNF overlapping key structure is enough for your needs. Um, so uh, in, in BKK020, they show that for DORAM applications where FSS is used as a building block of ORAM, um, you only need the one out of three security so long as you have the overlapping key structure that, that the CNF key sharing provides. Uh, so the, we have the lower bound of log n and an upper bound of square root n. Uh, so where does one out of three CNF FSS lie? Uh, and our uh, last result is uh, that, that there exists a one out of three CNF uh, FSS scheme that has communication polylog, which is near optimal. Um, and we show the construction of this protocol in our paper. Um, so in summary, we defined the notion of CNF FSS um, and demonstrated uh, its utility of uh, making standard FSS faster uh, or more efficient in terms of the key size. Um, we constructed a one out of three CNF FSS scheme that had near optimal communication. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's various applications of, of this work. Um, so because it uh, builds more efficient standard FSS, uh, we now you can use these more efficient protocols wherever uh, FSS is used. Um, the one out of three construction in particular gives us more efficient DORAM protocols. Uh, and because of the CNF F key sharing overlapping keys property, um, there are various applications for fault tolerance and redundancy. Uh, some open problems. So the two out of three case remains uh, an open problem. We solved the two out of five, or we didn't solve, but we reduced the communication of a two out of five case. Uh, but two out of three remains elusive. The best known is still the original, which is square root n. Um, and more generally, for, for arbitrary TNP, uh, can we come up with more efficient FSS protocols that are closer to the uh, lower theoretic bound of log n? Um, and are there other applications of, of this notion of CNF FSS? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions from the audience? So in the application to D or um, the communication complexity is reduced from FAT to FAT? Uh, well, from square root N to polylog N. Um, in that particular work, uh, the, uh, the DORAM protocol used a two out of three uh, DPF scheme um, as an underlying scheme to, to give the PIR and PIW uh, components of, of ORAM. So their, communica their communication complexity was root n, um, so it reduced from root n down to uh, poly log n. Um, I will say that in that, in that work, the, uh, the observation was that even if communication complexity was high, oftentimes the bottleneck in a protocol was the computation. Um, and, and both are using our uh, reduce scheme as, as well as using the original uh, square root n scheme. They both require linear work um, in the size of the DPF domain, um, which in, in practical terms, uh, when, when, you know, ignoring asymptotics is often the bottleneck. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Okay, thank you for. Thank you. I think uh, we'll go back to the first paper. Uh, is Eno there here? Um, hey, um, hey, sorry, everyone. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. We need to start. Okay. Thank you. Um,
Okay. Um, so, hey everyone, uh, my name is Inua Zhang and uh, I'll be presenting our work, Reusable to Round MPC from LPN. Um, this is a drawing work with James Bartos, like Sanjay McGark, and the Axiom Sarinivasan. So, we studied the problem of to round MPC. Recall in that uh, in this setting, we have many parties and uh, each party has their own input and they wish to learn the output of a circuit C on all of their inputs. Um, security says that uh, every party should learn nothing beyond the output of the circuit. And we, run, we want only two rounds of interaction. What this means is that uh, every party will send a first round message and then followed by a second round message. So in this work, we study the problem of reusable to run MPC. Uh, what this means is that uh, the first round message can be reused across unbounded number of second round executions. And let's look at an example, say that uh, somehow this party wants to compute a different circuit C2 on the same inputs. What they will do is to reuse the previous first round messages and just send an additional new second round messages. And that will allow them to learn the output of the circuit C2 on the same inputs. So here's our main result. Assuming learning parity noise assuming learning parity with noise assumption with inverse polynomial noise rate, then there exists either a semi-honest reusable to run MPC protocol in the plane model or a maliciously secure reusable to run MPC protocol in the CRS model. And here is how we do it. In the first step, we build a two-run MPC protocol for bounded polynomial size circuit. And it has the property that the first round of message size is independent of the circuit size. And we call the first protocol bounded first message sync MPC. Then in the second step, we show how to go from bounded polynomial size circuit into unbounded polynomial size circuit. And it still maintains the property that the first round message is succinct. And we call this first message sync MPC. The prior work has already shown that first message sync MPC is sufficient to realize reusable to run MPC. So let's do a quick recap of the main framework that we use to build a bounded first message sync MPC. The framework is to run MPC where run collapsing. And here is the template. In the first round, every pair of parties are going to exchange a set of OT1 messages. And in the second round, every party will release a sequence of garbled circuits. So what is the problem here? What makes the first message non-succinct? Well, notice that the number of OT1 messages exchanged in the first round actually grows with the size of the circuit. So that's the problem. And our question is, can we get large number of OT correlations with small first round communication? The solution to this question is to use pseudo-random correlation generator, or simply put PCG. And we want to use the PCG to generate OT correlations. So in the first round, instead of sending all the OT1 messages as their first round of messages, their party are going to agree on some PCG seed that is going to be independent of the previous uh, that is going to be independent of the size of the circuit. And intuitively, this PCG seed should allow these parties to get sufficiently amount of OT correlations that is going to be used in this two-round MPC framework. And we want each party to learn its own PCG seed, not the other party's seeds. So before the second round begins, every party is going to locally expand its own PCG seed. And the, as a result, these parties will get a number of OT correlations. Then they will just send the second round of messages as before. And it is important to notice that the PCG can be realized using LPN assumption with inverse polynomialized rate. And we can expand lambda size Cs into bounded polynomial size number of OT correlations. And in terms of the security, Intuitively, we can just replace all the pseudo-random OT correlations with truly random OT correlations. So as a result, we have built a two-run MPC protocol for a bounded circuit size computation with small first-round messages. Notice that the first-round message is small because 
we're only sending um, the PCGCs instead of all the OT1 messages. Now, how do we build a first message succinct MPC for unbounded polynomial size circuit from this primitive? So the idea is to use a GGM tree that use a PRG from a PRF. So let's look this into details. We define an expansion circuit N that will take one instance of bounded FMS and PC and produce two copies of the same instance. And we're going to keep building this, um, this tree until we have unbounded polynomial size number of leaves. And every leaf is going to support a bounded polynomial size evaluation. Now, in order to fit an unbounded polynomial size circuit C into this tree, we will first break down the circuit C into a polynomial number of randomized encodings. And every encoding is going to be of some bounded polynomial size that is going to be supported by every leaf of this tree. So we're just going to use every leaf node, which is one instance of bounded FMS and PC to compute every randomized encoding of the circuit C. So this will naturally lead, leads to a multi-round MPC protocol, where in each round, all the parties are going to compute one level of the tree. So to bring this down to just two rounds, we will apply the round collapsing compiler again to this multi-round protocol. And we will just squish all the third round messages. It also turns out that even after we apply this round collapsing compiler, the first round message is going, still going to remain succinct. So what we have built a FMS MPC from LPN. And in the next step, we're just going to evoke the result of the prior work. And this, um, the prior work has already shown that FMS MPC is sufficient to realize reusable to run MPC. And to conclude our talk, the main takeaway is that reusability in to run MPC can be built from LPN assumption with inverse polynomial noise rate. And to realize this goal, we have used pseudo random correlation generators and to run MPC, both of which are known from LPN. And our main techniques involve the garbled protocol, randomized encoding, and garbled tree approach. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Inu. Are there any questions from the audience? So the communication complexity of the second round is linear in the circuit size. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, in the uh, second round, the communication complexity is linear in the circuit size. Uh, in the second round, um, okay. Um, so here is the thing. Um, in the second round of the protocol, uh, sorry, let me bring it back to this picture. Okay, so notice that uh, in the second round of the protocol, they are actually going to compute um, the the um, this this um, tree of the uh, the MPC. Um, they are going to compute a tree that is going to support evaluating um, any unbounded polynomial size circuit, so that. Uh, the second round message will naturally grow with the size of the circuit to be computed. So that is going to be, um, actually it's going to be um, polynomial in terms of the size of the circuit. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, so um, I think I'd like to thank all the speakers of this session. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, <clears throat> everyone for attending.